He was a feared and mysterious killer known simply as the Unabomber. His bombing campaign killed three and injured more than 20 people. His calling card a manifesto railing against technology in the modern world. But it would be those words that led to his capture. Tonight, for the first time on television, we hear from the woman who turned him in. She sat down with me for 2020 on Discovery ID presents Homicide. The letter bomb went off at 8.30 this morning at Yale's Computer Science Center. He was the most wanted man in America, cold-blooded bomber who killed in Maine. He eluded the FBI for 18 years, a ghost targeting universities and airlines. Thus the name, the Unabomber. There's been almost as much money spent on the Unabomber investigation as all serial uh, murderers put together. He's that important. But in the end, his capture would all come down to this woman speaking out tonight in her first television interview. The longest FBI investigation in the history of our country. But how is it that you, a college professor, was the first to suspect Ted Kaczynski could be the Unabomber? The main reason, I think, is that the FBI began to release information. More on her in a moment. Nearly 30 years ago, there wasn't much information for the FBI to go on. That is until 1987, when computer store owner Gary Wright became the victim of the Unabomber's 12th bomb. As I drove into the rear parking lot, I noticed that there was a piece of wood. I went over to pick it up, I bent down, and I put my hand on the very end of it. And immediately, something happened. There was a big blast of pressure, and I was knocked about 20 feet backwards into the parking lot. What happened to you? Uh, when it went off, there was about 200 pieces of shrapnel that went through my body at various points. But just before Wright arrived... I found out that my secretary had been looking out this window right here, and she saw somebody kneeling down, pulled something out of a bag, and, and set it on the ground and they were looking face to face about four feet apart from one another. Now investigators were able to derive the first police sketches of the elusive killer, a mustache man apparently in his late 20s. We think we're looking for a white male with a high school education. He might even appear to be a very nice guy with no apparent predis predisposition to violence. But three bombs later, it's the Unabomber himself who gives the FBI even more to work with by contacting the media and demands two newspapers print a long manuscript he's written or the killings will continue. As we know, in so many cases of serial killers, pride goeth before the fall. The New York Times and Washington Post published the 35,000 word manifesto. It is blackmail, pure and simple, to which the Times and the Post have acceded. Were they justified in doing so? History might say yes, because a college professor, Linda Patrick, reads information the FBI releases and thinks she recognizes familiar sounding ideas from letters her husband, David Kaczynski, and his family had received from his brother, Ted. That must have been awful for you to have these suspicions that you're going to share with this man who you love. Yes, but it was really important to um, to talk with Dave about it. When she said, well, do you, I think maybe your brother's the Unabomber, I thought, well, this is not, this is not anything to worry about. Ted's never been violent. I've never seen him violent. Linda's suspicions kept growing. They had posted the first few pages of the manifesto on the screen computer in the lobby of the library. So Dave went with me. And then as Dave read the first page, I was sitting at his side and his jaw dropped. I thought I was going to read the first page of this, turn to Linda and say, see, I told you so. But on an emotional level, it just sounded like my brother's voice. David's older brother, Ted, had once had a promising future. He'd gone to Harvard at 16, earned a Ph.D. in math at the University of Michigan. But it's when Ted Kaczynski is a math professor at UC Berkeley that he gives up on mainstream society. He builds himself a small cabin in Montana and retreats from the world. He began to um, write very um, hostile, angry, resentful letters to our parents. I had a hard time understanding where the resentment came from. David and the family had long suspected Ted suffered from some kind of mental illness. But until now, David says, they had been in denial. How long do you think he was challenged with mental illness? 
And it's pretty clear that by the time he was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, he was suffering from some pretty serious delusions. The family makes the wrenching decision to contact the FBI. I thought about the um, families that were bombed. There was one in which the package arrived to the man's home and his little two-year-old daughter was there. She was almost in the room when he opened the package. Luckily, she left and his wife left and then he died and there were others. So I spent those days thinking about those people. On April 3rd, 1996, a nine-man SWAT team apprehended Ted Kaczynski in his cabin in Lincoln, Montana. They find containers with bomb materials, paneling nails, notebooks, containing almost 40,000 pages of writings, the typewriter in which he typed his manifesto. The FBI has arrested the man in Lincoln, Montana. Ted, are you the Unabomber? Well, the three of us were sitting together, Linda, myself, and uh, my mother, watching the rest of my brother on TV. I've never seen a street person that looked worse off than Ted looked at that moment. His clothes were tattered. Apparently, he had not bathed in weeks or months. I, I'm still sort of haunted by the look on his face. Kaczynski goes on trial in Sacramento, California, January 1998. It's clear the key issue in the trial would not be Ted Kaczynski's guilt, but his sanity and whether he would be spared the death penalty. My major argument against the death penalty for my brother is the fact that he's diagnosed with a serious mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia. Ted Kaczynski pleaded guilty to murder in exchange for life in prison. I would like to say that our reaction to today's plea agreement is one of deep relief. Most important, my mother and I wish to reiterate to the surviving victims our deep sorrow and regret to express our wish to reach out to you in whatever way possible. One of those David reaches out to is victim number 12, Gary Wright. I picked up the phone and I dialed the number and uh, I hear a voice on the other end saying, you've reached the right house at the wrong time. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. I was like, oh, so I mumbled out, well, I'm David Kaczynski. I think maybe you know who I am and um, I'd love to talk if you're open to it. I'll try calling back in a couple of days. First he just said, I want to call and apologize on behalf of my family. That exactly. was the first thing. Yeah. I said, well, you know, David, I have to tell you something that everybody has people in their family they probably want to apologize for, and it may not be at the same level, but I know people want to apologize for me, and you really don't need to carry this. That's, that's not your responsibility. What so a I, gift. Right. It, yeah, it was, it, it was like a gift. And in ensuing years, David and the man his brother tried to murder are crisscrossing the country, speaking out against the death penalty, advocating instead for reconciliation, mercy, grace. I think on some level, whether we recognize it or not in ourselves, there is this hunger for, for reconciliation, that, you know, violence not be the last word. I don't know if Linda understands how grateful I am to her. Linda saved lives. She saved our family's honor and self-respect and ultimately perhaps contributed to saving Ted's life, too. The series 2020 Homicide airs on Discovery ID.